WBRM Radio, and here doing a legacy interview with Coach Richard Laney with First Baptist Church in Marion. And thank the church for allowing us to use their facility for this. Well, can you tell me your full name? My full name is Richard Glenn Laney, known better as Coach. Coach, when were you born? What was your birth that uh, day of birth? March the 28th, 1934. So right now, as you see from this interview, you're 84 years old. 84. And where were you born? I was born in Hickory, uh, downtown Hickory. Cost fifteen dollars. Your your birth cost fifteen dollars. Yeah. The, Is that a good investment? I thought so. The the uh, guy that that hospital then he wouldn't charge preachers anything but uh, medicine. And my dad been a Baptist preacher. Uh, that's why I only cost fifteen dollars. How long did you live in Hickory? I lived there twenty two years till I came to Nebo. Uh, you, finished college. So you, you really enjoyed living in that community, didn't you? I certainly did. I, uh, those were happy days. I, I was glad I did them. I wouldn't want to go back and do them again. But uh, unless I could have them the way they were back in those days. But the Judah Hill was a servitude and they took care of everything then. What was your family like? First of all, what was your mom and dad's names? My mother was... Ethel Parker Laney, and my dad was W.C. Laney, William Carson Laney. How many brothers and sisters? I have uh, one brother and uh, two sisters. What are their names? Uh, my brother is named John. He was a, he was a minister too. He lives over. In, he's retired over in Asheville now. And then uh, I had a sister named Myrtle who was next to me. And she she died several years ago. And then Mary Alice um, lives in Atlanta, Georgia. And she's she was of course she died recently too. So just you and your brother are still living. Yeah, he's he's 89 and um, has health problems just like I do. So you grew up. Uh, in a family of preachers of sorts, I guess. Oh, yes. Your father and your brother both were in the ministry at one time or another? Absolutely. My dad preached 55 years, and my brother preached, uh, I don't remember how many years, but he uh, he went to seminary and he, he preached up north. My brother's a, he's not a southern preacher. He's a little more liberal than most of them at that time. He's a good preacher. He did a good job. We'll talk about your career choice in a little bit, but growing up with a, a father who was a preacher and a brother who was a preacher, did you ever consider the ministry as a, an occupation for yourself? No, I, I never did. Um, I know in my Sunday school classes, I ask, answer questions quicker than some of them, and the guys say, oh, he's going to be a preacher, he's going to be a preacher, but I just, I never was tempted to. Knowing you as long as I have, though, I know that religion has had a big impact. Oh, it did, absolutely. Uh, I, I believe in doing things the right way. Uh, I've made some parents mad over some of my rules, but uh, I was taught that if something is right, stick to it. And uh, I've always done that. What was your, your young life like in, in terms of, of early jobs you had and, and that type of thing? Any, any remembrances of, of that? Well, we had a guy in my dad's church that owned a dairy. They could sell raw milk then and could deliver it. And uh, so this guy, we, it, my dad would make me and my brother go over and work for him. And so uh, I went over there when I was in the eighth grade. I had to go over there and bottle milk every morning from 5.30 until we load the truck and go deliver it. So I'd work from 5.30 to 11.30, six, six days a week. And that was my first job. I got paid, he paid me $3 a week. 
Uh, and uh, then we'd go over there and help him uh, with his farm, with his farm materials. But no, we didn't. We didn't get paid for that. And my dad take the whole family over. There. We'd dig potatoes for him and stuff. So we we did. Uh, that was my first. But that was my first job on that dairy farm. When I was in the seventh grade, they, they gave me the job. My dad gave me the job as a janitor to the church. My dad ran that. He ran that church. Uh, he got rid of the deacons pretty quick, and he, he ran the church. I was a janitor from seventh grade till I finished college, and that really helped me out. Did you enjoy doing jobs like that when you were young? Oh, yeah. And your dad gave you this huge allowance? Oh, when I, yeah, when I was in the first grade, he gave me five cents a week. But that was a lot more back then. Oh, yeah. But he, of course, you know, he's like all dads, he slipped you this and this, but gave you that five cents, so that was uh, to spend the way you want to spend it. And how did you spend your five cents allowance? I usually bought a box, box of Cracker Jacks because they last longer than anything else. I even uh, buy cough drops sometimes, and flavored cough drops, and just treat them like candy because it lasts a long time. He had to take us up to the, on church on Sunday night after the last service. He figured Sunday was over then. He had to take us up to Dolly's Popcorn Stand in Hickory. The whole, we had four of us and he'd buy us all a box of popcorn. That's when they filled it, didn't close the top, just piled it up till it's falling off. I don't, I don't remember what that cost. It cost, I think, a dive a box. So um, then I, I had a job. I learned to drive uh, trucks. When I was 17, I worked for I, Cheryl Ison Fuel during the summer. And um, I delivered ice to restaurants in Hickory because they didn't have ice machines then. We would throw it in a machine, grind it up, shovel it up with a big coal shovel in the paper bags, and uh, go deliver that. And then we delivered our ice in the homes. We'd go in, just go in and put them in the ice box. Didn't have everybody didn't have an electric refrigerator then. But you did have electricity when you were growing up. Well, I had when I was six years old. They moved us from one house to another. The mill provided a house for the preachers, the two preachers. We had a house on one side till it didn't, didn't have an indoor indoor plumbing. Then they moved us across the road into a house one of the supervisors had been in. They gave us that one, and it, it had indoor plumbing. So. Uh, but we we had we had most most conveniences though. So when you got the indoor plumbing, you probably thought you were rich because you got a, you got a bathroom. We thought we'd die and go to heaven. <laughs> and out of that nickel allowance you got each week, uh, did you have to give church offering? No, my dad uh, he he made a offering for all family members and gave it to us on Sunday morning. We would put it in the box. Now my dad, we, we took up uh, offering. I never saw another church do it. My dad didn't believe in passing collection plates. He said, we give offerings. So we had three boxes on the altar. And uh, we'd get up, we'd sing a hymn. We had three rows of benches. We'd start on this side, they'd go back around the altar and put your money in the altar and then the middle row and then the third group went and uh, he said if you don't have to have money you just give yourself you give yourself to the Lord he wanted, he wanted everybody going by the, walking by the altar and then later on he decided to have a food bank so they put a, a box 
I mean, a big thing over there next to the altar where you could put your food, you could take food. And then we had a room back here we kept it in, me being the janitor. And if somebody came wanting food, I got to take them back and let them get them a box or two of food. So, uh, yeah, uh, that was, uh, that was, I just thought, a uh, very, very important part of my life to be involved in, in the way we did offerings in the church and the missions. My dad was called Mr. Missions anyway by the Baptist, Southern Baptist Convention because our church led the Southern Association in per, per capita given. Not in total, but your per capita. Remember, that led that for years. Any memories uh, about your mom? Maybe some favorite meals that she would prepare or you guys would eat when you were young? We ate chicken every Sunday. She raised them in the backyard. She'd go wring one's neck on Saturday. And that was, that was our dinner for the next day. We'd have rice, green peas, biscuit, and gravy. That was, that was our meal every Sunday. If we ever had a visiting preacher, that was a meal for him. Anytime a guest comes to church, she fixed that same meal. I guess she prepared your clothes and picked, you know, clothes, I mean, bought clothes that, that you guys wore back then. Any, oh, yeah. anything, anything different about clothes then versus later years? I mean, did you wear jeans and t-shirts well, and things like that? We, we wore, we wore jeans and just old work, what I call work britches. Uh, we didn't wear shorts much back then. You waited until you became a coach to wear the shorts, didn't you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> sure did that. Any other childhood memories you'd like to share? Or youth, youthful memories? Well, yep. I know we, we played ball. Then in the mill village, we had a parking lot down below us. And uh, every Saturday, every Sunday, we'd go we together and play ball in that, in that lot down there. It might, might be 15, 20 people on one side. And everybody came, we put them on the side. That was, a, that was a regular activity of ours. We played in the woods. We had woods. we just go in the woods. Sometimes for hours, and your parents didn't have to worry about you because nobody bothered you then. Did you have pets when you were young? What? Pets? Any pets when you were young? We had a dog named Bo Weevil. That was his, his name was Bo Weevil, and people ran for mayor of Brookford on the promise to get rid of Laney's dog. He was, he was mean. Were you the Laney or your dad? What? Were you the Laney they were referring to or your dad? My dad. So his dog, yeah. So they, he got shot, the dog got shot a couple of times. And uh, so finally daddy went down to Newton to the, and listed that dog as personal property on their tax records for $200 a day. And that's, that saved his life. Any, anything else? Mm, well, we always, we always had ball teams, the, the meal. Finance, we had you had a great ball field down there, concrete bleachers and dugouts, and, and the mill paid for all expenses. So we had we had teams from the time we were uh, about junior high age. They didn't have these youth these teams then, and uh, so I always always played baseball, and uh, then later on I started playing softball when I was seventeen. Uh, the mill had a softball team, and they let me play with the men. And uh, I was the first baseman till one year uh, when I was in college. Um, they told me I was going to pitch uh, for a month. They'd got the best pitcher in Hickory to play with us, but he's in college at UNC Chapel Hill, and. Uh, so they told me to pitch till he got there in a month, because I'd piddle with it some. And so I pitched for a month, 
Then when he came, uh, I liked it. So I, I left and went to another team. And uh, it turned out a good move because uh, within three years, I was developing a reputation as a pitcher. Your name, Laney, do you know the origin of it? Uh, what country your family originated in or anything like that? Not really. You really uh, got into genealogy, huh? <laughs> no, no. Uh, I just know my dad's people came from uh, the other end of Catawba County down past Newton. So as far as you know, you grew up in Catawba County, your, your dad's family came from Catawba County. You guys never ventured far from Catawba no, County no. In, in your upbringing. My dad's a um, priest at the Brookford Baptist Church. Um, he started out there, he, he, that was his first real preaching job. And he died at 83, still pastoring the church. So uh, we, we don't move much. So between your dad at, at 83 and your brother now at 89 and you in your mid 80s now, there's some longevity in, in your family it sounds like. Oh, yes. Let's talk about your family a little bit. Um, your, your first wife and the mother of your two children, Carolyn. Every time that you've spoken of her, I, I'd, I'd never met her, that was before I knew you, but every time you've spoken of her, there was always so much love in your voice and, and, and in your thoughts. Anything you'd like to say about Carolyn? Well, we, we dated, we started dating when I was in high school. Then we all went on some in college. And, but we dated for five solid years there before we got married. And uh, got married I, in uh, my first year at Nebo. Uh, couldn't afford to get married. You know, we, we come from a poor family. And we had to wait till I got paid one time teaching. And when I got paid, then we, had, we got married on a Saturday. I came back to work on Monday. We <laughs> couldn't afford a honeymoon. But uh, she, was, she was a good girl. She, uh, if you coach, you better have a good wife. An understanding wife. And understand. She went to all, all our games. Lisa, my daughter, was born on a Sunday morning. We had the finals of the conference tournament in McDowell County Saturday night. She attended the game. Got home, took her to the hospital at 12 o'clock. Dr. McCall delivered her at 4 o'clock in the morning. Well, you had four hours to spare. <laughs> yeah. um, it has been said about you, and I'm going to give Marty Queen of McDowell News the credit for this because he's the one that said it to me, said that, that Coach Laney has been blessed with two wonderful women in his life. Carolyn, your first wife, and then later after that, after children were grown, I think, you met Rinalda. Yes. And you guys were together for a long time, eventually got married. And what was Rinalda's full name? Rinalda Baby Usler. Yeah. Usler, yeah, I, I couldn't remember that part. And, uh, but I knew Rinalda pretty well. She would come to a lot of games with you and things like that. And, uh, but you have this, this story about how long you guys actually dated before you tied the knot, which is an unusually long time. <laughs> Well, it was only 22 and a half years. That's a good good engagement period. Yeah, and how long were you married to Ronaldo? About five years. And going back to Carolyn for a second, how long were you guys married? Me and Carolyn were married 27 years. 27 years. And she died of, she died of breast cancer. Yeah. And then Ronaldo died of lung cancer. Yeah, that, that's unfortunate, but, but you did have two wonderful women. Oh, two, two good ones, two good ones. And maybe a third, if you want to count your daughter, Lisa. Uh, she's the older of the, your two children? She's the older. Yeah. What would you like to say about, about Lisa and, and being your, your child? Well, Lisa, she's always been a good girl. She, uh, she always made the good grades. In fact, Jim Johnson was my first principal, and he knew we raised her among adults because I was pitching softball all over creation then. And uh, so we went up there to see to his house on East Court Street just before um, school took up. And he looked over and he said, honey, 
you're going to get to be a child for the first time in your life going to go to school and be around children. But uh, she's done well. She, uh, she, she always made, she's a lot smarter than I am. She made, she made good grades and uh, she finished McDowell High School uh, third. She was the third, hadn't been for many courses. She had been, may have been valedictorian. And then she went on to Wingate College and finished two years down there as a top student in the school. It was a two-year school then. And uh, then she came, went on to Mars Hill, finished up there with honors, and came to uh, back to Medell County to teach. Taught 15 years here. And then uh, her husband was moved to Charlotte, and so she went down there and did her other 15 years. So she followed in your footsteps. She became an educator just like her dad. Yeah, she's a better educator than I was. <laughs> yeah, a lot better. And Lisa has one daughter, so you, you have the one grandchild. One grandchild. Uh, she's living in Lexington, Kentucky. Yeah, you're telling me you have one grandchild, and she's 30 or so? 30 years old. Yeah, that's a bit unusual that you have just the one grandchild yeah. Not your oldest grandchild, but your only grandchild, and she's 30 years old now. My, my son Rick is not the fatherly type. He's a good uh, guy, though. Oh, good guy. <laughs> but he's an airplane pilot, and uh, his wife is an independent travel agent. They just don't feel like they have time for children. Rick, uh, last I heard, and I think it's still true, he lives in Las Vegas. Las Vegas. Flies for Southwest Airlines, yeah. is that right? Um, Anything you'd like to, to say uh, about Rick and he being the, the younger of your two children? Well, he's just a, he's a, just a hard worker. You know, he, he always wanted to be a pilot. I didn't know it. All of his friends knew it, but I didn't know it. And he, 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 went, he went to a wing at college a couple years, but then he left and went to UNC Charlotte so he could uh, get in the Air Force ROTC program and qualify for flight training. And so he, he qualified and went up flying a, a C-5 in the military until he uh, finally did his time. He, he did, uh, did nine years and then he uh, got out and uh, they called him back in for the Iraq war for another year and a half. So then he uh, Retired. He retired. I, I think after 23 years from act from reserve duty. But he's done well, and Lisa's done well. So I, I've been very fortunate with both my children. So you're you're proud of them as your kids. Very proud. Their accomplishments in life. Was so your Richard your son's Rick? Is he named completely after you? Yeah, he's Richard Glenn Laney Jr. But we called him Rick. We called him Ricky until he got into junior high, and then he decided he was not Ricky, he was Rick. So we switched. The thing I've always noticed with both Lisa and Rick and, and being around you is how much respect they always showed you. They were always so kind to you. Uh, you don't see that all the time from children to their parents. I thought they always exhibited that. They, you know, whatever you wanted, you know, they would do for you. They certainly have. I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't order two better ones. <laughs> well, they have turned out very, very well. I know that. Um, I, I was thinking back uh, the other day about a story you told me when, when Rick was living in New Mexico before he got to Las Vegas. And you drove all the way to New Mexico to spend a few days, maybe a week with him. And uh, you get there and find out, you know, he has other plans for the weekend, that kind of thing. And you said, oh, Rick, don't worry about me. I'll find something to do. And so you go get a newspaper and you find out where there's a high school basketball game in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And you go and watch high school basketball, two unknown teams to you. <laughs> well, that's just... Just a way of life. I just automatically pick up the paper and look for ball games. A coach and a fan always, huh? I went, 
I know I went to a one up in New York, um, Burnt, Burnt Hills, New York. And, uh, I, I went, out, went out there one day and talked to the coaches and the athletic director and compared their, their school with our school. And they said, you'd beat us in basketball and you'd beat us in football, but we'd wear you out in you know, hockey and all, all the stuff we don't even play. Yeah, even though I've tried. I've tried to get them to get hockey and lacrosse and stuff here, but <laughs> to no avail so far. You mentioned both your children at one time or another going to win get in, or Union City, Charlotte. Where did you go to college? I went to Lenore Ryan. I had to travel a long way, three up three miles a day. I, you know, it's in Hickory. So I went four years there and it uh, was very inexpensive back then. Did, did you play sports yourself through high school and college? I played uh, in high school. I played basketball and baseball. That's all. That's all we had at Mountain View. We had forty boys. Forty boys in the high school. It's part of Fred T. Ford now. But um, I went to Lenore Ryan and I played basketball one year there. I wasn't good enough to be a scholarship. They were going to give me some scholarship help my second year, but I could make more work and paying my way, so uh, I just played the one year there. How tall are you? Six, four. That's what I was thinking. So were you, you said you weren't good enough for scholarship. Were you a good high school player? I was, I was a good high school player. I, I was a big high school player back then. You didn't, you didn't have any six, five, six, eight giants in high school back then. I was the tallest guy in the county playing for a while until Rayford Wells showed up at St. Stephen's and he, he became an all-time great at Lenore Ryan, 6'6". Six, six. But uh, when I went to Lenore Ryan, the it was all going bigger. They, they used to play with 6'3", six, 6'4", six, guys, and they brought a 6'8", guy in from, uh, from uh, Pennsylvania, a 6'5", guy, and I knew that was the end of my days. And let's talk about how you came to McDowell County. You said you, you grew up in Hickory, you stayed in Catawba County until you were 22. Tell me about leaving Catawba and, and how you wound up in McDowell County. Well, the uh, Nebo sent a, a notice down there they need a coach. And uh, I wanted a small school. I wanted, and I saw it was a rather small We had had 160 students in the high school then. And so I came up and talked to him, talked to Lawson Brown, he was the principal, and um, Melvin Taylor, the superintendent. And um, a few days later, they notified me it was my job. Did you just coach basketball? I coached basketball, baseball, girls basketball. I coached girls and boys basketball. Even coached cheerleading one year. So you kind of got the full tour, huh? Yeah. <laughs> How long did you stay at Nebo? Sixteen years. Wow. Till we consolidated. A long time. So what was your first year at Nebo? 55, 50, 56, 57. So mid, mid to late 50s. And then you're, you're there for 16 years. And then where did you go after that? I went to uh, East Middell. Uh I just I decided... Uh, my last several years at Neba, we we won the championship in New County for the last six years and went to the state playoffs and I, it was getting to me. Uh, I thought it was just time to get out of high school coaching. So uh, I told them they they assigned me to the high school to coach girls and baseball. And I said no, I want a junior high. So they, they let me pick the one I wanted. I picked, I picked East McDowell because of their, their, their own mind in the county, plus you know, all the great facilities they have over there. And I stayed there until they um, separated the high school job, athletic director from coaching. So they did that when we brought John Anderson back in 82. So I, Ricketts came over, Dr. Ricketts came over to East one day and got me out on the ball field and 
said, I want you to come out there. And I said, okay. So uh, I stayed there my last 14 years. Dr. David Ricketts, who was principal at McDowell High at one time. He was, he was my principal at East. Then they took him to the high school. And later. And uh, I knew then that I'd, if he would be out there, because Dave was a great man to work for. Yes, he was. Um, you, you went to the high school as athletic director. That was your intention. Uh, what was that, like late 70s, early 80s, when you first went to the high school? 80, 1982. 1982. So had some turmoil with the basketball coaches in the early mid-80s. They come to you as the supposedly only there as an athletic director and say, Coach, we want you to, to coach the men's basketball team at the high school. And, and I think in the beginning, you tried to turn it down as best as you could. I said, no way. After a while, I realized I didn't have a choice. Uh, it was an order from the superintendent. And um, plus I was helping Dave out. Dave was in a spot. They had a little political situation there over the successor. So I said, I'll do it one year. But I said, if I, if I win 20 or lose 20, you don't ask me to do it again. And that was 1984, 1985, that, that, that season, yeah. And uh, Dr. Greer told us, and Ghost said, with what we've lost, if you win three games, you'll be considered a genius. But Derek Petit, say behind Derek, didn't play the year before. He didn't like the coach, and they had a one-year coach there. And so uh, he, he came out, and that really helped us. And, uh, and the boys were determined to prove they were better than people thought. And so we, we won the county championship, the tournament championship that year. Yes, and, and that was, I think, my first year that I was kind of fully involved, uh, working with the, the Titans uh, from a media standpoint, radio standpoint. And we went into that season with, with very low expectations. And you produced like a miracle team that year, uh, out of, not to demean anybody, but out of a lot of leftovers and, and scraps from previous teams. Well, they were, I know I told them the last game, we, we lost to Freedom in the playoffs. And uh, in an overtime, and I went in the locker room, and the boys were in there crying. And I, I said, "Fellas, I've never coached a team I was prouder of than what you've done this year." And, and Mike Lynch, the guy I had coached here for us, outside the door, listened to me. I saw him through the crack, and, and I came out, and he he complimented me on not chewing them out, but Praising them, uh, there's, no, there's nothing to do but praise that crowd. Yeah, it was a good group. It was a lot of fun to watch that team really overachieve, no yeah. question about it. After you coached the one year, you, you did what you said. You coached one year, and then you stepped aside. Who was the next coach? Bill Ellis. So Bill Ellis came in right after you. Yeah, Bill, Bill had been very successful at Statesville High School. And then at, he was there three years, and then... Yeah. And then Lloyd Church became the head coach, yeah. and he stayed for 22, 23 years. And now Brian Franklin has been the men's coach for the last several years. Wanted to talk to you about uh, Lloyd Church and him being one of your, your closest friends. He was, I, I kind of get the idea that, that you were grooming him for maybe even a high school student and player to one day be the head coach. You guys always seem to be so close as, as student, as athlete, as friends, and then as coaches. And, he always supported you and everything as athletic director, and in turn, you always had his back as the head basketball coach. I thought you guys had a really neat relationship. Well, I coached him in the ninth grade of East, and uh, I, I, I knew his dad. I taught his dad at Nebo, and I was close to the family, and, uh, and he had left us and went over to A.C. Reynolds with Ronnie Dave's. And, uh, I told him, I said, Lord, you come back and I'll make you the next head basketball coach. I said, Bill Ellis lives in Boiler Springs. He's not going to stay up here forever. He said, you can't do that. I said, you wait and see. And so he came back and uh, after three years, we named him the coach and 
He's one of the greatest coaches we've ever had. Great coach. Always obeyed the rules. Never broke a rule. Let's talk about Johnny Anderson. You touched on him a little bit earlier. He was the football coach at, at Marion High and then on two different occasions at McDowell High School. And again, it seemed like you guys were pretty inseparable a lot of times, that uh, you were always on the same page with so many things it seemed like at the high school with athletics. John made my job easier. Uh, he, had, he had a lot of uh, power. He didn't, he didn't use it, but he had it. A very popular guy. And uh, Dr. Greer told me, he said, the first thing I want you to do is get that coaching staff out there, pull them together. Well, John made sure of that. He made sure his seven football coaches cooperated with everybody. And so we just had a great relationship. I, I was certainly enjoyed working with John. And one other uh, of your friendships I wanted to talk about was in later years, you be become very close with Joe Tisdale. You guys would come to basketball games together. You, you told me a while back that you would meet up, I think, on Sunday evenings and, and always eat dinner together. No, Roman, Roman's restaurant in Nebo. And uh, so he's become a really tight friend of yours here in later years. Right, he, uh, you know, Joe coaches our girls' golf team as a volunteer. He works with them the year round over on the golf course. I mean, he, he's just a top-notch human being. There's a story you've told me a couple of times about uh, the difference in yours and Mr. Tisdale's ages. You want to tell us that little story? Well, Joe tells those girls that worked at Romus, so old Richard's older than dirt. I'm four months older than he is. And he just tells them, old Richard's older than dirt. He still does it all the time. He's just a great friend. We, we sit together in church on Sunday. Yeah. So dirt was invented in those four months between your birth and his birth. Right, <laughs> yep, that's exactly right. We well, mentioned attending church with Joe Tisdale, and we are here at First Baptist Church in Marion with this legacy interview. Um, tell me about your association with First Baptist Church. How long have you been attending church here and that kind of thing? I started here in the 80s when my, my son met Jay Abernathy, who was, Willis was our music director then. They were in school together, and, and he got Rick coming over here to their youth activities. And we were members of a, another church then. So we decided to come one Sunday. I'd always had thoughts about this church being a bunch of snobs and all this. And so we came one Sunday and we said, God, those people are just like me. They're just plain, simple people. We have, you have rich people and you've got, but the average one just like myself. So we, we've been coming here ever since. And they shocked, uh, shocked my family when they voted me a deacon ordained me a deacon. They couldn't imagine me being a deacon because uh, I just never was that outgoing in the church. I was very loyal, but I, but uh, this, this church just meant a lot to me. Had Dewey Hobbs yeah, and Bob Davis and now uh, Scott Hageman, all them great guys. Yeah, you started here when, when Pastor Hobbs, Dewey Hobbs was yeah. uh, the leader of the church. It's a beautiful church uh, and it's a great facility here for for this interview, and we, we kind of you know, talked about your you coming from a religious background with your family, but but faith has been an important part of your life throughout. Absolutely, absolutely. And I used to have a minister come to open the football games as a prayer till they finally told me I couldn't get ministers, so I let the Federation of Christian Athletes send me someone every Friday night. And uh, I just thought that was awfully important to start that way. I know a lot of people would play, a lot of kids would be playing while we had the prayer, but still I thought it helped. I thought it was good. And of course I always had prayer with my basketball team before, before they played. What you know of, of how coaches today deal with teams and how you dealt with teams back then, how has that whole environment changed with what you can say or do with with kids now in, in, in a, a basketball coaching situation? Well, they're, they're, they're not, as, uh, not as rough as they <laughs> used to be. Uh, today, they're, they're easier on the, the players. A lot of, well, you have to because they won't, they won't stay around if you don't. 
players won't won't uh, do what they did back years ago. I know Carson Gallon. I shouldn't even mention Carson. I guess, but he said if, if he was as rough on the kids in practice as Johnny and Coy were, they'd all quit. And uh, I don't think that's true. But uh, it is a different. It's a different culture now. If your age were not a factor, would you want to be coaching today? I don't. I don't really know. I, I don't know how to answer that. I. I, I just think I had enough. <laughs> you had your time. I had my time, and I came along and playing was uh, like it was in my day, and coaching kids that, that listen to you. I know. Uh, I coached girls and boys, and people ask me why. How'd you put up with coaching girls? I said I love coaching girls. I said, because they, they admit that you know more than they do. And the, the boys, you know, the boys, they got that little thing. Uh, but uh, no, I, I don't think I don't want to coach again. Several years ago, uh, I mentioned doing a radio show with Johnny Anderson. I also did one with, with basketball coaches. And that was around the time that you were, well, definitely you were the athletic director, maybe around the time that you, that one year that you were the head basketball coach at the high school. and. You had just come on board. Mike Silver was the, the Lady Titans head basketball coach at that time. And, and I, I, I went to the high school and said, Coach, we, we would like for you to come on and do the weekly basketball radio show with us each Friday afternoon. And at first, you, you kind of uh, gave me the impression that you didn't want to do it. But you didn't want to do it unless I would also include Coach Silver and the women's program. And when we agreed to do that, you said, OK, I'll do it. So you were kind of, you hear a lot of talk about Title IX and, and equality for high school sports for both you know, boys and girls, men and women. And uh, you were kind of ahead of your time. You were sort of a trailblazer where that goes and that you were willing to step back unless we were going to include the girls as well. Well, I just, I, it bothered me when I, I used to listen to the show before you took over. Mm -hmm. As always, the boys show. Well, I want to clarify, you, you were my first one, so I had nothing to do with that before. I guess, I guess you were doing that. Right. And uh, I, that just bothered me. But I wasn't out here, out here, out there to do anything about it. Then, then finally I was in a position to, and I wanted girls included. I mean, they were, our, they were our most successful program, and we were just ignoring them. For a long, long time, they've been very successful, especially under Coach Silver and now with Jennifer Brooks Kenninger. And even when Coach Silver retired and it was like, who's going to be our next women's basketball coach, you were in Jennifer Brooks, as she was then, corner all along. You felt that it was time that we had a woman coaching the, the women's basketball team. I think it's a lot better to have a, have a woman with them. Let's talk a little bit about some of our radio experiences. We had probably 25 or more years together from time to time doing, doing radio. And uh, you got to do some state basketball championship games yep. with me. We were at Carmichael Auditorium when the Lady Titans won the state championship in 1991. Uh, did a couple back-to-back -back in 1998-1999 at the Dean Dome, the Dean Smith Center in Chapel Hill. Unfortunately, lost both of those. You were kind of my broadcast partner for a lot of those years there. And, and uh, I try to get you to come back and join me now. I know it's a little bit more difficult with your movement and, and things or lack of movement. But uh, it was always a joy to have you on the radio with me. And, and any remembrances, any, any thoughts about, first I'll tell you, we have a picture of you and I doing, I think it's the 1998 state championship, McDowell and Southeast Raleigh. I have a picture of, of us you know, in the booth there at the Dean Dome broadcasting that game with the WBRM banner in front of us and all. So that's a very cool memory. It's hanging on the radio station wall right now. I just I thoroughly enjoyed all of it. I I couldn't believe it. You wanted me to help broadcast. I I don't have a broadcast voice anyway, and I never had any experience. But I I just thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, but uh, I, I I just felt with with your good, great voice and my old foghorn, I always I tried to keep my mouth shut all I could. Voice or no voice you had the knowledge yeah. and, and it was great to hear your perspective. But I know I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed 
that Reynolds Coliseum because I, I, I went to Reynolds in uh, 1952 to see a, a college regional and I hadn't been back in that place since that, that time. And uh, so, uh, I, and then to be down on the floor level, yeah. I, that was just a thrill to me. And it was a great game. I mean, it was a yeah, close game. Uh, Fayetteville 71st won the game against the McDowell 80 times, but it went right down to the wire. And that was back when Anna Atkinson was on the team and, and everything. It was a fantastic game. Wanted to ask you about your, your hobby of, um, you're a history buff, right? Yeah. Especially Civil War? I wasn't until I started, until I was forced to teach it. I came in, when I came to Nebo, with no more students we had, you, you, I only had two PE classes. And I had to teach the U.S. history. And I always hated history in school, but I never had looked at it from that side. And I got, I, I got so involved, I enjoyed my history classes better than I did my PE classes. And then I got, on my softball trips, I got to visit a lot of famous battlegrounds all over the place. Went to uh, Gettysburg, Antietam, um, just, just all, every summer I'd find me a battleground somewhere. And I went out to uh, the Mississippi River when Rick was in pilot training and got go to the battlegrounds out there along the river. So it, it, was, it was just a, a, a big love of mine. How many states have you visited to look at military cemeteries or, or battlegrounds? I don't know. I've been to 30-some states. I've been to about 35 states. I haven't, I haven't traveled in the northwest part of the country. But um, I, couldn't, I couldn't say how many there's four battlegrounds, but for the battleground around, I found it though. And you've lived in Nebo the entire time you've been in McDowell County? No, I lived on South Main Street uh, for, till Lisa was, Lisa, uh, no, no, Lisa, what, you were born in Nebo. Uh, I, was a, I guess I lived down on South Main for about a year, year and a half. The house next to the, Chiropractors shop down there. That that two-story house. I had two rooms in it. Cost me a fortune. Cost me twenty-two dollars a month. People would love to pay that now. <laughs> well, a week, a day. Well, my wife Carolyn. You know, we weren't married yet, and she came up with me one day. And Mrs. Ramsey was a supervisor for the school system, she took us out hunting a, a place to live. She took us to the old, the old hospital up here, the old one, this apartment building. And they had four rooms there tied together, $70 a month. And boy, my wife, Carolyn, wanted that. But I didn't take it. And, uh, so then we went on back home. She, she, she told me, well, you go find a place, you know, you know what we need. I found that two rooms down there in that building and uh, for $22, I said, that's what I want. And I read that and I brought her up and showed it to her. Her face just dropped to the floor when she saw where she's gonna be living. But we, we, we enjoyed it. We were there, we had good friends. Two other couples lived in the house and it turned out to be a nice place. She wanted that apartment building, and you wanted to save forty-eight dollars. <laughs> so we, yeah, we've been in Nebo ever since that South Main Street. So other than maybe a year, the the, year, the, so. the entire time outside of that one year, you've been in, in Nebo, which is what I've always associated you with. I've always thought of you as, as being a Nebo person. So you've spent your life as a coach and, and as a teacher. Going back to that twenty-year-old Richard Laney many many years ago. Would you do it all over again? Would you choose the life that, that you have chosen and lived? I would. Uh, I, didn't ever, I didn't intend to choose this life. When I went to college, I was going to be a, 
a recreation director some town. That's what I had in mind. And so uh, my junior year, I got to thinking, well, why not get a teaching degree in case? And so that, uh, that got me in, into that. And, and then when I graduated, I got that, that job at Nebo popped up. And that's just exactly what I was looking for. So it's just, I could have gone another way. But I'm glad, I'm glad I didn't, though. I had a chance. Jim Broyhill, you know, he's a congressman. He'd have me to come over to Lenore and pitch softball against this four-man team. Pitcher, catcher, first base, and shortstop. They, they didn't have a pitcher that could hold down those four. They'd have me come do it, and I, I met him one night and over there at the game, and uh, we talked a while. And uh, on Monday, I got a call from their main office over there. Said, Mr. Broyhill said, you sound like our kind of man. Had me come over for interview. And they were going to put me to work $10,000 a year. And I was making five teaching. Uh, that, that was tempting. But uh, Mr. Broyhill told him to tell me to go back and think about two weeks. Would I be satisfied in furniture instead of teaching and coaching? And I thought and thought, and I, I said, I can't do it. And so I stayed with the teaching coach, and glad I did. You mentioned softball. You played competitive softball for a lot of years, didn't you? Until I was 51 years old. A fast pitch. So they don't have it. I don't know if they have it for men anymore. The women all play it. I was out in Chattanooga playing in a tournament. Took Rick, my boy, with me. And uh, I... I looked at him out there and I said, what is a 51-year-old man doing in Chattanooga, Tennessee, playing ball like a little boy? So that was my last year. Came to a realization there, huh? Yeah, well, I, I really quit because you had to travel every weekend and it, we didn't have local leagues. I was 51, I didn't, didn't want to travel around to play softball all the time. But uh, yeah, I, I played that. We played in, uh, we played from Ohio to Florida to Missouri. We played all over, all over this eastern part of the country. You're 84 years old as we've established and what do you see different about the world today versus when you were a younger man or even you know, 20, 25 years ago. How have things changed in the world as a whole? Well, we're, 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 the churches scare me to death. I come, I come to church here. I used to come here in the 80s. Saints were always full every Sunday. I come now and there's 150 people there maybe. And all churches are, are, seem to be that way now. The, the moral end of the country bothers me quite a bit. And I, I go to ball games and I listen to the language from the, the students just walking around the gyms. And I, it, just, it just bothers me that uh, morality is, is stooped to this. But I, I just, I still feel it'll change one day. Back, I hope. When you were a coach, if I'm not mistaken, you didn't even allow your players to listen to music on the bus, around the game setting, anything like that? No. We played over at Watauga one night that year. I coached the high school, and one of my players slipped the radio in, earphones, and we got beat. And I blame that loss on that radio. <laughs> so you had that. And uh, he's a good old boy, the, the, the guy that had the radio. But uh, I, I still told him no, no more radios. I said, we don't take a basketball to your dances, so you're not going to bring radios into our ball games. Looking back on, on Coach Richard Laney's life, has Coach Richard Laney's life been a good life? Been a good life. Good life. Wouldn't change anything. 
perhaps some things I've done, uh, <laughs> I mean, minor things, I would probably do different. But uh, overall, I'm, I'm satisfied. All in all, you've done well, right? I've, I go to... I go to restaurants now, and people I taught years and years ago, they still come up and talk to me, and um, a lot of times pick up my ticket and say, you don't need that, and they go pay my ticket. So I feel like I must have done some things right in dealing with people. They, they, say, they say I did. And you hear talk about role models and things like that, and, and maybe without even realizing it, you have been one all these years, to your family, to your students. I know I say a little prayer every night before I go to bed, and I always say I hope that I have been fair to everybody. What is the one thing you would like people to remember about Coach Richard Laning? Well, I, I just hope that I've been fair. I think I've been fair to my students, my players, uh, I know Rick Condry down here owns Condry Heat and Plumbing, played for at Nebo. He's 60 years old now about, and he, he's forever talking about things I did with him. And uh, it just makes me feel good to think that, that I really did uh, treat people right. Well, I can say from my experience, uh, we weren't doing radio sports at the high school. And when I went and pitched the idea to you in your office at the high school, we would like to do games live on the radio, you immediately said, tell me what you need. We will make it happen. We will make it work. Yeah. You were always so accommodating. So uh, you speak, you, you hope you've been fair. You were beyond fair to me and have been, you know, my 30 years or whatever I've been associated with high school sports. Uh, we have the McDowell High Athletic Hall of Fame now, which started, I think, in 2008, if I'm not mistaken, was the first class. And you went in as the, the first dozen, the, the 12 that were inducted in 2008 as the first group of the High School Athletic Hall of Fame. You were in that group along with Coach Johnny Anderson and several others. And one of the comments I made at that time was, if you weren't in the McDowell High Athletic Hall of Fame, why have a McDowell High Athletic Hall of Fame? Because you have been one of the most important people to walk through those schools and doors, I think. Well, you know, uh, that was interesting. When they formed that, they had the date set for the induction. And I'd been in the hospital for nine days. Uh, had a growth in my stomach. They took out my gallbladder. I was dehydrated. And uh, I told Lloyd the church, I said, I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it. He said, if you don't, we're going to call it off. That, that impressed me. But uh, I know uh, he, he had everybody line up down at the end of the gym. I said, I can't do that. I can't stand that long. I have set up there at the score table, and you let me be the last one you call out. And then I can go out there and maybe stay, stand long enough to be recognized, and he he did that. So that, that impressed me that they thought that much of me. I'm sure they wouldn't have called it off, but he said we would if I couldn't be there. But you didn't call him on the dare either, so <laughs> you showed up. But uh, yeah, I mean you're you're certainly uh, have always been a, a leader at the high school, and, and it was good to see you inducted into that. That first class in the Hall of Fame still going strong here a decade or so later. So, but you were there. You're on the wall. Well, uh, I loved Nebo School when it was there, but um, my final love is McDowell High. I still love McDowell High School. All right. Any, any final thoughts from from you? Uh, anything that you would like to say as we uh, come close to wrapping up this legacy interview with you? Well, I just appreciate the opportunity to. To run them out a little bit, and uh, I appreciate the fact that you're here doing it, and these people in charge, they, they do a wonderful job. Well, Coach, thanks for coming out and, and doing this legacy interview here at the First Baptist Church in Marion. Always good to talk to you. You've been a, a great friend to me for the last, I guess, 30, 35 years, um, and I hope many, many more years. So 
thank you for everything you've always done for me and, and for the schools and, and for the athletic teams at the high school. So thank you for everything. Well, the thing, things belong to me, to you, because you've done so much for us. I give you a bro hug. How's that? Yeah. <laughs> I had my walker here. I could get up. <laughs> good to see you, and good to see you're doing as well as you are. Thank you.